Good morning, everyone. My name is Molly Pembroke, and I want to thank you all for joining us today for our webinar. Today's webinar will focus on designing PCBs with GDR3. Before we jump in, I would like to give you a brief introduction to Trilogic and what we do. Trilogic, for over 30 years, has provided software and services enabling engineering groups to design, develop, and deliver products through excellent support, training, and consulting services to help you achieve success sooner. Oasis Sales has been a mentor premier partner for over 16 years. Their industry knowledge and experience make them uniquely qualified to understand your business and how technology will make their customers successful. As you can see here on the map, these are the regions that each Oasis and Trilogic cover. Here you can see the different design and product management areas that Trilogic covers. You'll notice that we've tried to create a suite of products that will provide a front-to-back solution all the way from concept to end of life. Make sure that you're subscribed to both Trilogic and Oasis YouTube pages. As you can see, these are the two pages. You can search them by Trilogic or just Oasis Sales, as well as all of our other social media channels, so LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Our next webinar will focus on easily managing your libraries and components, and that will take place on December 13th. So make sure that you're signed up for that one if you're interested. And now I would like to introduce today's presenter. Today's presenter is Kanchen Bidia. She's a technical marketing engineer for the PAD product line. She has a master's degree in computer engineering from Missouri University of Science and Technology. In today's world, DDR3 is used in a wide variety of applications. This technology is no longer restricted to the high-end PCB design market. DDR3 has a complex data bus and it's important to understand correct methodology that should be used to route those nets. Together with PADS Hyperlinks DDR and PADS Layout and Schematic Design, the user is equipped with the simple yet powerful platform to create their DDR designs. This flowchart explains what should be the normal design flow when designing DDR circuits. First step should be creating a schematic. This can be done using the design guidelines of the DRAM chip vendor. The user can validate that design in Hyperlinks Line Sim to validate signal integrity, timing, and crosstalk analysis for critical nets. Remember, Line Sim analysis can be time consuming and it's only a what if analysis. Therefore, limit the number of simulated nets to the most critical and few nets. From here, the user should generate constraints that can be used for placing and routing the board. Once the layout is ready, it should be passed to PADS Hyperlinks DDR and DDR Wizard will perform signal integrity, timing, and crosstalk analysis on the whole DDR circuitry. If the design passes all the timing and signal integrity thresholds, it can be passed through to the next step of creating a prototype. If the design does not pass the checks, try to find out why it fails and go back to the layout stage, fix the issue and check again until the design passes. Before I get into the details of the DDR wizard and explain how to set it up, let's go through the basic concepts of the DDR design. In a simple comparison, we can see that DDR3 has a higher data rate, lower supply voltage, and a higher prefetch size. DDR or DRAM chips come in two types, unbuffered and registered. Registered chips don't have to drive the entire DRAM circuit and avoid having stubs discontinuity. DDR signals can be divided in two main groups. Data group contains nets such as data strobe. There will be one strobe for one byte lane of data nets. Data strobe is a differential signal made up with DQS and DQS bar. 
data nets are called dq nets and are usually grouped in one byte or 8 bit groups these groups are called byte lanes also for each byte lane there exists a data mask bit Data signals are bidirectional and both DQ and DM nets are referenced to DQS nets. The other group consists of ACC which stands for Address, Command and Control Lines. This group consists of address lines, command lines, clock enable, chip select and on die termination, etc. These are unidirectional lines. Clock is a differential signal and all the ACC signals are referred to the clock. In DDR circuits, ACC signals are shared by all the DRAMs. They are usually routed in flyby topology because this topology creates minimum stub lengths. Unfortunately, this means DDR chips receive commands at different times. To compensate for this, data byte lanes need to be adjusted by the controller. This is taken care of by the controller's internal leveling mechanism. DDR circuits can be configured with 1T timing or 2T timing requirements. With 1T timing, a new command can be issued on every rising clock edge as against 2T where a new command can be issued with every other rising clock edge. The user gets higher setup and hold timing margins with 2T timing. During read cycle, DRAM acts as a driver by driving the net and the controller acts as a receiver. During the write cycle, it's exactly opposite with the controller acting as a driver and the DRAM acting as a receiver. AC threshold indicates the voltage level at which the receiver must meet its timing specification. The DC value indicates the voltage levels at which the final logic state of the receiver is unambiguously defined. Once the receiver input has crossed the AC value, the receiver will change to a new logic state. Make sure you have the appropriate IBIS models that meet all the requirements for DDR simulation. The pin and diff pin section should list all the single-ended and differential-ended pins. Model selector section allows different nets to have multiple on-die terminations. And lastly, make sure that the AC and DC thresholds are defined appropriately. We need to gather IBIS model for the controller and the DRAMs. By using LineSim link, we can import the schematic in Hyperlinks LineSim. One of the first things to look into would be the stack up. It's important to plan your stack up ahead of time as vias and trace stubs can cause extra delay in signaling that the designer needs to take into consideration. Using the Z0 planning tab, the user can decide the trace widths and separation for single ended nets and differential ended nets. In the LineSim environment, using the Sweep Manager, we can approximate which on-die termination gives the best signal integrity results, at what length of transmission lines the delay between DQ and DQS becomes so large that it fails setup and hold requirements, etc. All this analysis should be done on a few critical nets to ensure that you are getting the results you wanted. Example, Data lines should be bidirectional, DQS should be differential, etc. Once we have the routing constraints, we can use them to create the layout. Now we can view the whole layout in the VoltSim environment and make sure our DDR circuit meets the timing, signal integrity, and crosstalk requirements. Let's go through DDR3 batch mode simulation step by step. Once the layout is ready and planes are flooded in pads, click on Tools, Analysis and DDR Analysis. 
this will create a dot cc file that gets loaded into patch hyperlinks ddr once we are within the hyperlink sports sim environment it's important to first make sure that the libraries are set up correctly if they are not the parts will not get assigned any models to make sure that they are set up correctly click on setup options directories the design folder where the cce file is located is automatically added to the library path it also adds the default hyperlinks libraries to the path make sure your ibis models are either in the paths defined here if not you can add a new path that points to those models we can also define a qpl file path this assigns models according to part numbers the best way to make sure that the paths are set up right is by selecting some of the nets of concern and making sure that they have correct models assigned to them if your reference designator mappings are different than the default hyperlinks mappings for example all the parts that have a reference designator with the first letter c is mapped as a capacitor according to hyperlinks if in your design the controller reference designator is cpu hyperlinks will not be able to detect the ic unless we specify that in the reference designator mappings now that all the basic setup is done we can start the ddr batch simulation this opens up a ddrx batch mode simulation wizard the initial page explains what the wizard does it's a summary of all the information that the wizard needs from us and then it performs multiple simulations on each individual nets finds out the worst case timing values for the entire ddrx interface since the wizard has such a complex setup it allows the user to save the setup and then import it the next time they have to run the simulation the file that stores all the settings has the extension of .ddr if it's the first time simulating the ddr interface we can start by setting the type of dram that we are using the data rate and the supply voltage the data rate is usually specified in terms of speed grade with the unit of mega transfers per second the actual operating frequency is half the speed grade for example for ddr speed of 1066 mega transfers per second the operating frequency is 533 megahertz In the next page we can define which one of the ICs is the controller. If you don't see your controller part in this list, make sure to check the reference designator mappings as discussed previously. Here we can define slots and ranks for the DRAMs. Slots are the physically separated entities such as multiboard DIM designs. number of slots for a single board design will be zero unless you have stacked dies ranks are the number of drams that share common control signals especially chip select signal the easiest way of telling how many ranks you have on the board is by selecting a data line if it is connected to more than one number of dram chips then you have that many ranks on your board On this page you can define the ibis models. It's highly recommended that we do that before we start the ddr wizard or we can use a ref file to apply those ibis models using a reference designator. Next to simulate page allows us to specify which nets need to be simulated and what kind of simulation should be run on them. Data nets are bidirectional and should be simulated for both read and write cycles but to save time on simulation we can choose to simulate only one Data nets are always referenced to data strobe nets Clock to strobe skew timings are simulated to make sure DQS and clock are in sync and it captures the measurements required 
to create a write leveling delay file and minimize simulation runtime. If this is checked, only then we can calculate the round trip time for DQS. If checked, compensate signal launch skew adds additional delay to all the signals. Address and command nets can be run at 1T or 2T speeds depending upon the design requirements. For example, it's recommended that we use 2T timing when the capacitance of the address lines is too large. In most of the cases, we'll be using all four AC and DC thresholds instead of just VTT threshold. In the next few pages, we can select which net name maps to what nets in the DDR circuitry. If we click on Perform Automatic Net Mapping, Hyperlinks looks up in the IBIS model for the various pins and maps them to different net categories such as clock, strobe, data nets, data mask nets, and address command and control signals. If the user wants to change the mappings, he can use the next few pages to adjust it accordingly. In the next few pages, once all the nets are identified, we can select which one of them should be simulated. If you want to run a quick simulation, simulating all the nets in the DDR circuitry might be too time consuming. For example, let's say we are confident that RAS, CAS and ODT signals will meet the requirements. Then we can uncheck it and simulate others. This page lets the users decide which on determination model should be used. Let me jump one step ahead and quickly jog our memory about read and write cycles. DDR wizard is a tree structure and we can click on any step listed in the left side. During the write cycle, the controller is writing to the DRAM, which means the controller is the driver and the DRAM is the receiver. If you consider DDR nets as their individual transmission lines and that they are terminated at the receiver or the load side, then it means the controller on die termination should be disabled and the DRAM on die termination should be enabled. Similarly, for read cycle, since DRAM is the driver, its on die termination should be disabled and because the controller is at the receiver, its on die termination will be enabled. This configuration will change if you expect to terminate at the driver instead or if you have multiple ranks and slots of DRAMs. Going back to the ODT models, this page lets us chart what ODT models should be for various nets within the DDR circuitry. Remember, ODT models are defined in IBIS model and if they are defined in the model selector section, only then they will be displayed in the DDR wizard. There are columns for strobe nets, data nets, and mask nets. For each of the nets, we can define on determination model when the ODT is disabled and when it's enabled. For example, when the ODT of the controller is enabled, we choose the model of 40 ohm. When the ODT of the DRAM is disabled, we choose the model that has 0 ohm termination and vice versa. On the next page, we can select IBIS model selectors for clock, address and command and control nets as these are unidirectional and the models remain the same for read and write cycle. On this page, we can set up which timing models should be used to compare the simulation timing to determine if a design has passed or failed. The DRAM's timing parameters are controlled by JDEC standard. Hyperlinks includes all the DRAM timing files which are compliant with the JDEC specification. The timing parameters at the controller are not controlled by JDEC standard. Hyperlinks includes CTL.V files for the controllers, but these models are to be used for an initial what-if analysis only. 
For the final timing analysis, you will need to create a timing parameter for the controller. You will need to understand different timing parameters from the controller's datasheet. If they are not readily available, you will need to contact your vendor. To help with the process of creating controller timing model, Hyperlinks provides timing wizard within DDR Batch Simulation Wizard. Now let's discuss the controller timing parameters required by the DDRX wizard. TCKAC is the delay between the address and command output signal transitioning to valid before the rising edge of the output clock. This delay is only applicable to the address and command signals on both read and write cycles. TCKCTL is applicable to control signals on both read and write cycle. It is the delay between control output signals transitioning to valid before the rising edge of the output clock. TCKDQS is applicable to clock and DQS signals during the write cycle. It is the skew between the rising edge of the output data strobe and the rising edge of the output clock. TDQS DQ is applicable to data and data mask signals and it's associated with DQS signal during the write cycle. It is the delay between the data and data mask output signals transitioning to valid and the associated output data strobe edge. TDS is short for setup time and TDH is short for hold time and is applicable to DQ signals and its associated DQS signals during the read cycle. Setup values are positive if DQ must be valid before DQS. Hold timings are positive if DQ must remain valid until after DQS. On this page, we can specify write leveling delays. As discussed previously, due to the use of flyby technology, there is some unwanted skew between clock and data strobe. Hyperlinks can generate a text file called autogeneratedDelay.txt, where the delays which will compensate the flyby topology are listed for all DQ, DM, and DQS nets. We should run the wizard on the design once, rename autogeneratedDelay.txt file to something else in order to avoid rewriting of the same file. The newly named file can be imported in hyperlinks DDR wizard on this page. This will add the required compensation to the nets. Remember that this is a feature that may not be present in all the controllers. Make sure that your controller has this feature from its datasheet before running the simulations. We can define what the stimulus or the input stream bits should be for the DDR simulation. DDR wizard generates a pseudo-random bit pattern of a certain number of bits. But if wanted, we can edit the bit stream to any combination of zeros and ones. We can choose whether or not the crosstalk should be considered in the simulations and if it should be, what should be the thresholds for it. Because this involves more calculation, adding crosstalk into consideration might mean slower simulation times. In the simulation options, we can choose which all process corners we want to simulate and other finer simulation options. We specify the maximum runtime per net. This is a good check to catch issues with the setup or any other errors. The timing parameters can't check for SI issues such as overshoot, undershoot, etc. We can define those here. By default, the standard JDIC parameters are used, but if you have a different requirement, we can change those values as well. On the report options page, we can select what kind of reports we want after the simulation is finished. We can decide whether we want to audit the setup or simulate the DDR interface or both. 
under audit the tool checks ic assignments and settings to make sure that the interface is set up correctly and will simulate batch simulations are lengthy and time consuming and it helps to catch any setup issues in the audit the report is generated in a specific folder where the cce design file is stored we can change the name of the folder but if checked we can add a date and a timestamp in the folder name so that it's easier to keep track of the simulation results we can either save the results in an excel sheet or the html format along with the simulation we can generate csv files that will list all the cases worst case and violation cases and has the ability to store waveform in the csv format that can be read in the hyperlinks oscilloscope once all this setup is done we can start the simulation make sure there are no errors in the error window otherwise the simulation will not give accurate results save the new .ddr file and click run because i selected to create an html report in the setup at the end of the simulation an html report will open up and the tool will show in what directory on your computer are the results stored at depending upon the different selections we have made we get various tabs in the report for the read and write cycles the report lists every data and data mask net their pass or fail status setup and hold time margins overshoot undershoot etc address lines are referenced to clocks and their setup and hold timings and overshoot and undershoots are listed as well even for the differential nets the si checks are listed the failures are highlighted in red let's look into those in detail looks like dm0 and dm1 failed to satisfy the overshoot and undershoot margins of 400 millivolts dq6 setup margin for write cycle is negative other violations are on data read cycle where dq5 and dq6 seem to fail due to negative hold margin and negative setup margin ddr wizard also creates a few spreadsheets in the result folder let's open ddr report for jdec measurements let's try to understand what the values in the spreadsheet mean the rise rail overshoot for dm0 is 458.3 millivolts the maximum rise rail overshoot limit is of 400 millivolts which means the margin is negative 58.3 millivolts this measurement was taken at 23.548 nanoseconds this is the worst case overshoot for the dm0 waveform similarly we get worst case undershoot performance at 21.513 nanoseconds with fault rail undershoot at 535 millivolts and undershoot margin of negative 135 millivolts because i had set up my ddr wizard to save the waveforms i am going to open them up in oscilloscope environment clearly the signals have a lot of reflections and if we probe at 21.513 nanoseconds we can see the undershoot in the waveform this means that we need to inspect the termination strategy for data mask nets we can change the on die termination for the data mask nets in the ddr wizard setup and run the simulation again to ensure no si issues occur dq6 fails in the setup margin by 26.5 picoseconds for the write cycle and by 46.8 picoseconds in the read cycle during the write cycle the worst case setup time was reported at 2.734 nanoseconds note that there is a good hold margin in both cases tds margin is derived from the formula as shown here if we load the dq6 and dqs0 waveforms in the oscilloscope 
we can see that the dq6 signal is lagging behind by a very small time lag this is the reason why there is an extra hold margin but not enough setup time upon investigation we can see that dq6 net is too long as compared to dq5 net therefore we must edit the layout and run the ddr simulation again to find the optimum length of routing similarly for dq5 signal the whole time margin fails to meet the minimum requirement tdh margin is derived from this formula and is equal to negative 40.1 picoseconds if we load the waveform in the oscilloscope we can see that the dqs waveform trails the dq5 waveform by a small margin if we inspect the lengths of dq5 compared to dqs we can determine that dq5 net length is too short to allow for a good hold time we should change the layout and run the ddr simulation again for every failure we should investigate what makes that failure occur signal integrity issues timing delays due to various routing layout issues crosstalk incorrect timing models and inaccurate ibis models can lead to failures of the ddr circuits with pads hyperlinks we can investigate each one of those in detail and easily fix the problems that occur thank you everyone for attending